Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, no. note, which is actually a keynote roundtable on the future history of the Anthropocene. Uh, I am Adam Wittberg, the of the Environment at the Division of History of Science, Technology, and Environment at KTH, member of the Environmental Humanities Lab. And with me today, I have uh, three. Uh, hopefully four fantastic speakers the fourth speaker uh, seemed to have some issues in joining hopefully he will come in but we'll start with uh, um so uh the first speaker uh, i would like to introduce is uh, sabine Hella. she's a uh, associate professor of uh, science and technology studies and head of department of philosophy and history at kth uh, Sabine has a background in physics, and before she started working on history of science and technology, uh, and before joining KTH in 2011, she was a fellow at several prestigious German institutions. And in 2015, she published the book Spaceship Earth in the Environmental Age, 1960 to 1990, a book which has become uh, some, something of a must read for those interested in post war. Um, environmental politics. Uh, among her many publications, I would also like to mention her recent article, Writing History in Scaling Accountability and Accumulation, issue, uh, uh, which is also called Writing History in the Anthropocene, which came out last year. Uh, the second speaker I would like to introduce is Sverke Sulin. He is Professor of Environmental History at KTH. Uh, the Division of History of Science, Technology and Environment, and the founder of the Environmental Humanities Lab, which hosts this conference. He was also one of the driving forces of making this fantastic conference happen. Uh, Sverker has published widely uh, on themes relating various, to various as aspects of the environment uh, in, in many ways, but for the sake of time, I will limit myself to mention his 2018 book, The Environment, uh, The History of an Idea, uh, which he co-authored with Paul Ward and Libby Robin. And for those uh, of you who speak Swedish, uh, he also published a fantastic book called The Anthropocene, an essay on the age of mankind. Uh, uh, he was also, also part of the uh, uh, team of authors behind the Planetary Boundaries articles in, 20, in 2009, uh, which introduced this concept that has now gone all the way to have its own Netflix documentary. Uh, many publications i could mention uh, he's also a permanent member of the swedish government council for climate politics which reviews the swedish climate action um i will move on now to introduce our third speaker uh, julia adene thomas uh, she is associate professor of history at the university of notre dame and has worked on many themes within environmental history after several influential books on Japanese history of politics of nature, she has in the last few years published several important books on, and articles on the Anthropocene. Uh, yeah. Among them are uh, the book with geologist Jan Salasiewicz and Mark Williams, uh, a book called The Anthropocene, A Multidisciplinary Approach, which is a fantastic book that really weaves together history, geology and social sciences in a very clear and illuminating way. She's also published uh, the difference between the Anthropocene and climate change, and has two books on the Anthropocene. On and uh, finally, Fernando Vasquez, who was is our fourth speaker, but unfortunately had trouble in joining us. He may come in late. For for now, uh, we will uh, start with uh, our three panelists. So uh, the way we're going to do this is that we're going to have a... Uh, oh, we have Rolando with us, I see now. Fantastic. Well, now, uh, review, um, 30 seconds, because I said that Rolando was not here, but now he is. So I have to finally introduce Rolando Vasquez, uh, who is an associate uh, professor of sociology at Utrecht University. Over the past two decades, uh, he has been one of the more important voices in the decolonial movement and has published widely on the complex of coloniality, modernity, diversity, and visual culture. Among his recent publications is the book Vistas of Modernity, Decolonial Analysis, and the yeah. End of the Colon and uh, the important of yes. Earth and 
surprising design in which he shows how modernity's way of worldly as artifice and earthlessness the Anthropocene in which he proposes decolonial thinking as a form of for an ethical life with Earth. Uh, rounds of presentations, so our four fantastic speakers that will make this uh, round table uh, spark with ideas and thoughts and perspectives. Um, and the setup, the idea of how we want to do this is that we're going to give each uh, a chance to, to kick off uh, or have a provocation. Uh, them just a few minutes and they give us something to the Anthropocene to which our other speakers will then have the chance to respond. This will start up uh, the discussion and the speaker has had a, a kickoff uh, and to the questions, the many questions, many thought-provoking, complex and interesting questions we mentioned. We cannot promise that we will answer them all but we will certainly discuss them. Uh, during all of this, uh, we will be missing your questions in the chat. So please just post your questions uh, in the chat as you come up with them. If there are something that we can uh, sneak into the discussion uh, in the first half, if it's something that fits, uh, we may pick it up. But otherwise, we have uh, thought that the second half of this um, 90 minutes will be more for direct questions. So if you have a, then have a question to uh, an individual speaker or to all of the speakers, you can post them. Uh, but please go ahead and start posting. They come along. So as a starting point, then uh, this would be the order. order uh, we just let the speakers go uh, alphabet. Hello, we start. Celine, and then Julia, Adney Thomas, and finally Rolando Vasquez. And uh, since we're all in different parts of the world, uh, I may mention that I'm currently in, in Stockholm, in Bagamossen, looking at, at the evening sky. It's now okay, because I know some of our speakers are in different parts of the planet. So, Sabina, uh, uh, the, the stage is yours. Well, thank you so much, Adam. For, for this very kind introduction and also for, for bringing me into this event. Um, well, uh, my provocation is necessarily about the future history of the Anthropocene because I find it so very intriguing to imagine this future historian um, to, to write about uh, the Anthropocene after the fact, right? It, uh, this question that, that you brought up with the round table, it really, addresses the Anthropocene not primarily by examining the human past as we so often do. Um, we, we usually define what the Anthropocene is by demarcating when exactly it started. So we struggle with beginnings but we do not spend nearly as much thought on how it might end. Um, and this session, I think, challenges us to take uh, the position of this historian in the future, storying the Anthropocene as a distant epoch. Now, I, I admit that I have very little experience with these matters of temporality and time, right? I'm a historian, but then also preoccupied with the past. Plus, my own work is centered on spatiality, as you also just um, presented. How, like, how spatial scales work together to bring the Anthropocene into view. But I think that we would do good to also turn our attention to the temporalities because they bring out the paradoxes of the Anthropocene's categorization as an epoch. Or to quote a classic book by Joan Scott, the Anthropocene has only paradoxes to offer. So I believe that the future history of the Anthropocene is such a paradox. Uh, the Anthropocene is the age of human intervention on the planetary scale with a long past of accelerated industrialized resource consumption and pollution. So its future might actually be very short. Right? If we don't believe in the powerful heroic Anthropos who will manage to change course, the Anthropocene might be the shortest scene in geohistory and quickly be forgotten. If we want to believe the forecasts of an Earth under climate change, 
Anthropos will have a hard time to survive in large quantities. And I think this is an interesting paradox. So the, the epoch designed to mark humans' workings on the planet will be the crown and also the end of a long timeline. The Anthropocene might not even have a formal ending because who would declare it ended when humans are no longer around and what would succeed it? if not extraterrestrials or dispersed human communities or a whole other species or a new technological intelligence will maintain the geologic timescales, the Anthropocene will end the epochal series. The biggest paradox is perhaps the observation that the Anthropocene is entirely situated in our present. So of course all geological epochs in the geo history are human made and human centered projections of a deep past from the perspective of a very thin or shallow present of the 19th and 20th centuries when those geo historical narratives were first formed. So all pasts have a history. We know that as historians, we know this. But central for me is that humans manage to include them, ex exclude themselves to a large extent from, from this canon of Earth history. We heard that also in Deepesh Chakrabarti's presentation yesterday, right? They excluded themselves from that Earth history. They authored it. This is, a, in, in a way, a god trick of the, the human universal and om omniscient observer, barely in, inscribed into this story or affected by it. And in those cases where humans have self-inscribed self into like the Neolithic revolution or the theory of evolution, these stories have been very progressivist. Instead, the Anthropocene now has been a real-time experiment. So it's still ongoing. It's real-time recording humans' massive interventions on the planet as they happen. And this experiment must necessarily be open-ended. Since I work with science fiction and often in fictional mode, I'd be happy uh, perceiving the Anthropocene as science fiction and speculating on humans' end or renewal. Much of the literature corroborating the Anthropocene certainly is, I think, of the genre of science fiction. And I want to end with uh, like throwing two science fiction stories at you. Um, the conventional story would perhaps be this one. The future historians of the Anthropocene are members of the dispersed communities of Homo sapiens which survived the Anthropocene due to their immense wealth and exclusive shelters. With rather modest archaeological tools, they dig into our long gone present to construct their own past from our fossilized remains. They name their own epoch the Symbiocene, stressing cooperation, or the Noocene, stressing cosmological wisdom, or perhaps the Revisionocene, determined to do things entirely different from now. I think that a more yeah, likely, perhaps also more, more interesting science fiction scenario would be this one. The future historians of the Anthropocene are entities from the dispersed communities of artificial life and consciousness which survived the Anthropocene due to some decentralized energy resource hubs. They are not interested in history. With unprecedented computing power, they access the data records of the human past to construct knowledge and tools for their own present and future. They name their own epoch, perhaps the Technocene, stressing their superior technological life forms, or the data scene, stressing versatile data engineering capacities or the algorithmo scene, stressing the proliferation of an artificial intelligence that is faster than any living organism. And uh, I would like to note that all these, these uh, labels for what succeeds the Anthropocene have actually been used, I think, apart from the revisional scene, which I simply made up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabina, uh, for this uh, very intriguing uh, provocation kickoff uh, to our discussion. Uh, there are many uh, threads in this, uh, the future uh, of the Anthropocene, and uh, 
I would like to to pass the word on directly actually to to Sverker and Serlin. Uh, so I will let them all the speakers respond in alphabetical order. So please, Sverker, uh, go ahead. Um, uh, I figure uh, uh, not my own intervention. Yeah, well, actually, I, thanks, Bina. This was uh, great. I, I got many thoughts. Uh, I, I will just bring one for this little comment, which is that I, it occurred to me when you started speculating about um, what might happen here, and this might be a short epoch, that you did not mention, uh, actually, I think an alternative that, that has always been in my mind, namely that um, if humanity w works things well here, it could be even shorter, namely by withdrawing the impact <laughs> so that we might actually somewhat uh, perhaps uh, 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 to our chagrin, quickly move out of this after only a couple of generations when we have sort of reached various targets that are set up by environmental governance uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I, th I think that's, um, I don't think that necessarily any of these propositions are realistic, but maybe there are um, heuristics that we can sort of think with and speculate with. And when I'm out speaking about these things, there are always some smart heads in the audience that start speculating about the end of the whole thing <laughs> immediately and put up various very tricky scenarios. And I think this receding Anthropos, uh, the, the lowering of the impact, in fact, that was an, a, 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 a version of that came up in Dipesh Chakrabarti's talk yesterday as well. So yes, on to someone else. Thank you, Sverker. Uh, yes, the, the, it's definitely stretching uh, our imaginations and, and perhaps that's a, a practice that we need to get used to in these challenging times. Uh, Julia, uh, what is your uh, response or thoughts on, on Sabina's words? Am I, so I'm now supposed to respond to Sabina, is that the... Yeah, if you want, you yeah. can, you can, you can, no, yeah. That's, that's, that's the idea, yeah. yeah. Sorry if I got my, got my uh, um, instructions incorrect. Uh, Sabina, what I was really interested in what both you said and Sverker alluded to was the idea that this is not just going to be an epic. And what the scientists are now suggesting is that our impacts are so great, it may go to a higher order of transformation of the Earth system so that we are not in an epic, but perhaps something even out of the, out of the quaternary. Era and um, you know that that means we're certainly not going to res rescind the anthropos or anything of the sort. Um, and then, as you suggested, Sabina, there will be no historians or perhaps anything uh, uh, capable of managing uh, the systems anymore. And so, I I wish I saw the possibility of a retraction of the Anthropocene. I, Zabirka, you can you can cheer me up later, um, but I don't see much prospect for that. I think I think we'd be lucky to keep it at an epic level. Thank you, uh, Julia. Um, I come to think of also uh, the book by uh, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway that many of you know, uh, the collapse of Western civilization, where. Uh, parts of humanity ev evidently have survived and, and can write the history of, of the collapse of Western civilization. That is something else than the, the end of the Anthropocene. But, but it's an example of how this, um, how fiction actually can be an important heuristics in, in how we, how we um, face the Anthropocene. But I would now like to pass the word on to, to Rolando uh, to, to see if you have any thoughts on, on Sabine's words. Um, Uh, thank you, Adam. Sorry, I've been having technical problems. <laughs> I was logged out automatically because somebody is logged into my account, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> into the platform. Uh, well, I couldn't hear everything of Sabine because I was logged out. But uh, I think for me, well, when I speak, I will speak a little bit about that. It is important to see that the Anthropocene is attached to the history of European modernity and that uh, whatever comes next is after the end of this project of civilization. So I think it is very difficult to speculate what comes next with the same tools that are producing the Anthropocene. 
So that will be, I think, my call for humbling our prospects of the future. And what we see, I mean, we have also written about is uh, the movement towards the futuring, that we are losing possibilities into the future because of the mass extinction of the loss of worlds, the loss of knowledges that could produce alternative futures. And that is really worrisome. And as you write in your paper, the technological response to a technologically driven Anthropocene is very, very limited. We need to really move beyond that paradigm. Thank you. Thank you, Rolando. So, um, so from this uh, first uh, kickoff, we can really see uh, the need for, for mind stretching alternatives uh, for, for different ways of, of uh, facing up the Anthropocene, of, of seeing uh, how it will play out. And uh, we'll move on now to Sverker Selin, who is next up with a short uh, kickoff or provocation. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, my, I'm sure I'm very, going to be very provocative, but I, I will start by saying that this is, um, it's been fascinating to have been so directly involved in a moment of very profound historical change. And I'm thinking there of the, the article you mentioned, the Planetary Boundaries article that we worked with now almost 15 years ago. And um, then uh, more articles along the same line in the following decade. And um, and mo most of the of the teams were scientists, uh, and I, I was the odd man out often. So but that was, I think, very interesting to be part of that. And he, he, I learned a lot, and it has also motivated me in my work. And this is very much linked, I think, to the concept, in my view at least, to the concept of the Anthropocene. These were people who also were advocates of the uh, Anthropocene. I was a bit reluctant, I must admit, on the Anthropocene arguments to begin with. Uh, I reviewed some articles in that field. Um, I shouldn't go the list down the list now, but some of the most important ones. And I, I, I said very, I sent very <laughs> brief reviews to the journalists and said, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure sure I agree, but this will be much discussed. It will be important to publish it quickly, and they did. And uh, and n now we are here discussing it very earnestly as imp as a very important thing. And I I was uh, really hard pressed to accept it as an epoch, whatever you call it. Uh, like many humanists, and we had those debates some years ago. Uh, and and I think it what made me come out finally, so to speak, as an advocate was above all what I would like to call the consciousness effect. That if we, I mean, geology is so powerful, it's like anatomy of the body, the human body or something like that. You learn the bones of the body, you you learn the kidney and the and whatever you have inside the heart, and you learn the geological epochs. If you add something to that, it's going to be for schools. It's going to be for the 10 year old to come back to, to, to home to the parents and tell them, you know, have you heard this story about the Anthropocene? And then by implication, they need to talk about not just geology, but about human impacts on the planetary scale. And the parents will say, no, or, you, you must be kidding. <laughs> but but the, the kids teach their parents to, to change. So for me, it was more or less a sort of a political idea rather than necessarily a scientific fact although I underwrite those as well, of course. So applying a stratigraphic concept would be to accept on the civilizational level, so to speak, a new view of the human earth relationship. And that brings me to something which is probably might be provocative. I, I see this as, as actually something going on on the civilizational level. I, I, I see a new Weltanschauung emerging based on these discussions and these concepts that we are talking about here. Not just a geologically changed perspective, but also a new way of thinking about humanity and our role on the earth, on, on, on the planet, in fact. Uh, which also mean, means, I think, or implies a possible new beginning of organizing societies according to what we know and according to principles of, well, we, we can call it justice and fairness. And you may this might seem like a Sunday sermon, and perhaps it is, but I think if a future historian is going to look at what is going on now in the coming few generations, um, I think this kind of, political and societal debate about what we are going to do now is going to be very much at the center. 
and, and from this, I think, follows a few questions that I would like to ask to all of us, in a sense, adding to the list of questions we already have to talk about. Uh, I, I, and I think uh, the first thing is, will it happen? This is a very basic question to the stratigraphic committee and to the geological community that decides it on, on, the, on whether the concept will be accepted as an epoch. That we don't know that. That's, it's still under debate. And I have a very open attitude to that. I think it's like 50-50. Will it happen? That's the question that needs an answer. It will affect us very much. And then what will it impl imply? Is there any realism in what I just said, that th this will actually be part of a changing mind frame, if not the age of Aquarius? So at least something profoundly changing. And then if that might be true, uh, what will change and how? Because that is what an historian in the future will talk about, is what, what happened in the 21st century? How did it end? How did that century end? What happened meanwhile? We will not stop doing other things while we are talking about the Anthropocene. And I think perhaps the final question that I would sort of provoke you with is, is, is to ask, is Anthropocene actually a civilization? A kind of a, a, a way of, of, of sort of acting uh, as humans, as humanity in, in the world where we live, in, in, on the planet where we live? Is it, is it going to be sort of a major transformation uh, for good or bad? Uh, or is it just going to be something that can be still somehow marginalized to the scientific community where it still, I think, stays to a large extent, although humanity also contributes a lot? So that's my little thought about this. Thank you so much, Serker, uh, for adding more uh, thought-provoking questions and for, for this uh, interesting uh, kickoff. Um, I think there are uh, many ways to respond to this, but, but it's uh, clear that we are continuing now to, to expand our, uh, our views, our ways of, of uh, looking uh, into the future and the past. And uh, I think that uh, Julia uh, will go next if you don't mind julia do you want to say something in response to circus many questions here uh... <laughs> certainly i do um yes this is this is just a joy to have all these questions on the table i have two responses one is really a non-rhetorical question really an open question and that is the way that the word civilization is used in these conversations. As somebody who um, academic work has focused on a place which is sometimes seen as you know, the non-West, the non-civilized, there's always an edge to that term. And I don't, I wonder if that's something you all feel or whether that's just particular to uh, the conversations that uh, I have as a quote unquote orientalist, which is of course a word we don't use. Um, the second and more important uh, response I have to Zverker's very interesting notion of the political efficacy of the Anthropocene is simply to say, here, here. I hope I, that they will formalize the Anthropocene. Of course, a formal proposal will go up from the AWG next year, the beginning of 2023, um, but then it's got a long way to go. And as you suggest, we may have only a 50-50 chance. But the political efficacy, efficacy of this concept is very important right now. And I would say this, uh, particularly in response to how the conversation is currently being framed, certainly in the United States and elsewhere, as a problem of climate change. And climate change is presented as a problem. It is a technological problem that can be solved and we can continue to grow our economy. And we have books by people like Bill Gates explaining how from his private jet, he looks down on sad little Africa and realizes that he can light up the night sky so African children can do their homework. And he never asks himself the Anthropocene question, what does that do to biodiversity on that precious continent? What will it do to light up the night skies everywhere 
so that animals that require nighttime for mating or navigation or, or hunting will be bereft of that. And what the Anthropocene does is frame our challenge not as a problem, but as a predicament that requires radical alterations in the way our economy, society, and politics work, as well as our biogeophysical uh, chemical uh, systems. And I think, uh, Zwerker, that's why I'm ex very excited about this concept of the political efficacy of the Anthropocene. I think we need it. Thank you, Julia. Uh, we, we're uh, really uh, getting getting our, our feet warm here in discussing these uh, this complex really of of, of uh, dimensions of questions that we can uh, look into, and uh, and uh, certainly uh, as as asked, uh, what you ha you have to ask yourself what will happen if if it's not uh, accepted if there is no anthropocene. Uh, what about all of these discussions? Well, I would say at least that, that the Anthropocene has a very vivid life beyond uh, geology already, which this conversation is a uh, testament to. Uh, but moving on, uh, Rolando, do you want to, to respond to, to Sarkis' uh, thoughts? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Sarkis. Well, I think here my call will be to shift the geography of reason because if you go to the most affected places and if you go to the global south or the global south in the north the indigenous territories you will find them that anthropocene has been happening that the loss of land the loss of habitat the loss of worlds has been a lived experience so since colonialism some people have experienced this over complete overturn of their reality of their livelihood of who they are and it is just now that the West begins to ask itself if if this is happening. But I think for uh, for most indigenous thinkers, this has been happening for 500 years, and uh, and they just see the West as a, let's say in this sense as back in history because they have seen the demise of their civilizations and they have seen the. Uh, deep transformations of their livelihoods due to these anthropogenic processes. I mean, for example, in Central Asia, people living around the, the seas that are no more, the mountains that are no more, also in all across the global south as well. So, so I think we need to begin uh, thinking with the thinkers of the south that have not been put in the canons of philosophy or history, but that have been thinking this deeply since the beginning and being aware of it. I mean, indigenous voices have been speaking of the death of earth for many, many years. And it is just now because science can measure it in the ice caps or in, or in the concentration of the atmosphere that we begin thinking about it. So I think uh, we really need to shift the geography of reason and begin listening to thoughts that we never paid attention to because we thought of them as non-academic, for example. Thank you, Rolando. That's also a, a very uh, interesting response and an important one to to look to to how things come to be, how things come true, really, in, in uh, our thinking about Earth and the environment and uh, the dominant role that Western thinking and, and science, in particular, have. It's uh, before we have measurements and data, uh, the, the concepts uh, seem irrelevant. But when the data is there, we somehow perhaps hopefully start to see that, that other uh, strands of thought have been relevant and can there, thereby correct that aspect. And Sabine, what's your, what's your thought about this? Well, first of all, thanks, Sverka. A very uh, provocative, really. Um, uh, and. Uh... I, I agree. Uh, will it happen? That's an interesting question, because if it does not happen and does not become an epoch, it will be deflated in some way, right? That will be deflating. If it will happen, it might end history. So uh, how do we keep up as historians in, a, in, a, like in, a, in an epoch that claims to be stable? 
Um, and I wonder whether there's the receding anthropostat then will hand over powerful agency, agencies to someone else. So I cannot really imagine that end. But as a historian, I fully agree uh, in a way. I, I don't need to know whether the Anthropocene is an epoch and when it started exactly and when it ended or when it will end. Um, because I, th I always embraced it uh, with all its deficiencies that I absolutely see um, and I think need to be discussed. It still gives us as humanities or environmental humanities scholars this, this leverage. Um, uh, uh, an approach, um, a, a perspective to bring together things that we haven't thought as belonging together as much, um, like earth history, earth sciences, uh, and societal history. So that bridge was, I think, really dearly needed to, to be made, that we needed this, and it has already um, we have already appropriated this concept, as Adam said, now it has a, it takes on new lives. We have adapted it to our most pressing questions. And I think we will continue to do so uh, and for good reason. So with all our critiques, uh, which is absolutely needed, uh, even the, the Anthropocene even allows us to formulate that critique in the first place that otherwise perhaps we would have a hard time to express about global inequalities. Um, inequalities of wealth, um, the gradients of, of possibilities in the world, um, but link that to, um, to material deposits or accumulations and, and changes that and, and, and extractive imaginaries. That I think is what, allow, what the Anthropocene allows us to do and what it should also allow us um, uh, to do in the future, regardless of what that uh, commission decides. And I, I think that it should be in every interest, in the interest of any historian of science and also in the interest of environmental humanity scholars to, to keep our, our hold on this, uh, on the concept. Um, that will be my, my short answer, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sabine. Uh, I think taken together, these, these responses uh, also show how uh, how far we've gotten. Really, we'll get back to this to to the GSSB, the date and the critique and so on in in the further discussion. But I think that already we can see that uh, well well beyond uh, the Anthropocene Working Group and and, and the establishment uh, of of, uh, of an epoch. Uh, the concept as it has traveled uh, beyond uh, its origin in geology has made things visible in a combination of science and and uh, critical thinking from all across the humanities and social sciences that has now somehow been ratified that you can no longer deny this way that you could before the anthropocene that's that's a thought that i at least get from from listening to all of your uh, interesting responses and um, I think moving on now to, to Julia. Uh, Julia, do you want to, to go? Uh, Indeed. Thank you, Adam. Um, in my two minutes, I'm going to focus on the relationship between environmental humanities and the sciences, plural, of the Anthropocene. Because one of the questions that Adam and, and Zwicker put to us was how will these debates that we're having now look to a future historian? And I think that one of the things that future historian will see is an enormous tension and antagonism between many people in the environmental humanities and the science. And this is curious to me. Because when I look back at environmental history and you read those early texts, people are so excited about the science. They consider the scientists to be collaborators, people that they're actually going to learn from and teach. There's going to be a kind of dialogue. And that very exciting moment seems to have evaporated in many quarters in our world. And even as the 2018 IPCC moved uh, to say climate change is not our rubric, 
The Anthropocene is our rubric. The 2020 UN Human Development Report was circling around the Anthropocene. Within the humanities and social sciences, there has not been the deep engagement with the sciences that there needs to be. And what I thought I might do is just talk about the two primary sciences of the Anthropocene, which is probably going to bore your pants off. But never mind, we're all on Zoom and nobody can see whether you're wearing any. Um, so let me, let me talk about Earth system science and geostratigraphy and try to be precise about these words because I've noticed in our conference that many people don't seem to really get what the scientists are trying to say, at least some of the scientists are trying to say. And I think the great mystery for many people is earth system science. They don't really know what it means. It's something I wasn't taught in school, even though it goes back to the 1920s and Vladimir Verdansky and this conception that earth and inorganic matter were interacting actually had to be seen as one, which of course gets evolved in the 20th century through Lovelock, through particularly NASA and the development of the Bretherton diagram in 1986, which puts human systems and natural systems together in a little diagram with lots of pointed arrows. And it is out of that science, the science that sees the life forms on this planet and the inorganic matter operating together as an integral entity that Paul Crookson comes up with the term Anthropocene. He's not a geologist, he's an, anthro he's an atmospheric chemist. And he comes up with this term because he sees the Earth system as dynamic. It's not static, as somebody said yesterday. It actually moves from one system to another system through the stabilization, which is what we are seeing now in the Anthropocene. And Crookson, as everybody knows from his 2000 article, says it goes back to the late 18th century. And the International Geosphere Biosphere Program says, wait, our data doesn't go back that far. And so they're the ones that come up with the great acceleration graphs. And everybody's going, wow, we thought it was going to be gradual. But actually, the Anthropocene is mid 20th century. That's when it happens. And Paul Crookson changes his mind. He says, all right, the Anthropocene is in the mid 20th century. And that's an interesting story that then the, the, ge the geologists, the astrographers, the paleobiologists, people like Jan Zalasiewicz and Mark Williams pick up on. And they say, you're talking about a new geological time interval. We should get in on this act. And then they carry it forward in the ways that we know today. So essentially, as an historian looking at this problem, I see two different questions. One is the question of what happens in the middle of the 20th century that coalesces all these different forces and creates the stratigraphic markers, destabilizes the planet. And that's a whole array of things a lot of which we thought were great. Things like antibiotics, decolonization, sanitation, new forms of agriculture that could feed people. Now it looks at least ironic, but that 20th century moment, what happened then, is the question about stratigraphy. And those people working particularly on nuclear issues, um, of course, can speak to the very noticeable difference in the strata. And that will probably be one of the markers, will most definitely be one of the markers in the GSSP. But the Earth system question is a different question for historians. Because the Earth system and human beings have been interacting for as long as our species and our predecessor species have been around. So suddenly we're getting not just a 20th century history, but a very deep history, a very gradualist history of gaining capacity, of learning how to master fire of domesticating animals, 
70,000 years ago, the human brain getting uh, somehow reconfiguring itself so that it can deal with symbolic logics of various kinds, complex societies, and then those markers of domestication of animals and farming, as well as the more recent things, colonization, industrialization, and all the rest of it. So we have two different stories that come out of understanding the two sciences, two primary sciences, certainly not the only sciences, behind the Anthropocene. And I think if we are clear about the, what the scientists are telling us, the radicality of what they are showing is mind blowing. And I think that's why there's such resistance to the Anthropocene in some of environmental humanities quarters. We don't, we don't know how that, we don't have the categories for dealing with the novelty of this way of thinking. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. Sabina knows this, I don't know. She's probably got no pants on right now, but um, never mind that. Um, so I, don't, I hope I haven't bored you, but this is why I think we need to be so clear about the sciences so that we can understand how radically new and different our humanities, our history have to be in response if we're going to take this understanding of our planetary state seriously. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julia, for this very uh, lucid and, and uh, exciting and uh, clarifying uh, kickoff. Uh, I, for one, was not at all bored, but rather, as I said, very excited. and. Uh, Again, there are, are uh, a million ideas and threads present in, in this that we can pick up on and everyone will will get their uh, their turn. And of course, uh, implicit in what you are saying is the, the GSSB, the, the choice of a marker, which has been the subject of debates also between Earth system scientists uh, uh, with clear political uh, connotations, which we, again, we can return to them, I think. Uh, I would rather just thank you and move on to Rolando, who can uh, get a chance to, to respond to, to Julia's uh, uh, kickoff. Uh, well, I cannot agree more. I think um, even though the sciences are at the core of the project of Western modernity, it is through the sciences that we are finding a way to show um, proofs of the race histories and of the enormous violence that has built this uh, era. So the fact that we can now measure in, uh, well, this is something a bit of what I will talk a bit later, but I can just say briefly now that we can connect these Dutch Flemish paintings of the 1600s of people skating in the little ice age of Europe with a mass genocide happening elsewhere due to the European project of colonization and the drop in earth temperature because of mass death. Uh, that is something really important that science is allowing us to do, to connect these two histories uh, where people just admire these paintings as a beauty of a Flemish painting or Dutch painting of people skating in small towns and not being able to connect that that small ice age is due to uh, to genocide. So because the genocide has never been told because those histories are erased from the canon of history. So I think science is helping us to challenge the canon of history and to show that there are so many histories that have been untold and that uh, and that we insufficiently understand the beauty of that. Flemish painting. Thank you. Thank you, Rolando. I think that uh, this really um, shows uh, something that, that again was was in, in Julia's uh, talk and also in, in Julia's work and the work of other people here, like like Sarke. I think the need for integrative thinking, integrative humanities, multidisciplinary approaches, because with this with the, with the basis from the basis of science we can now construct integrative multidisciplinary transdisciplinary approaches which you know
tied these uh, threads together. They were all they were always tied together, but they just did look like they were separate for uh, for a time. And there are predecessors in thinking, like Julia. I think in your book you bring up Alexander von Humboldt as as one of the predecessors for Earth system thinking, and I think he's a he's a great example of that. And he was not by chance, I think, also a, a vehement opponent to the slavery and colonization from from being an eyewitness to it in, in Latin America. Uh, but but someone who knows uh, science and technology also well is Sabine. Do you want to respond, uh, uh, Sabine? Yes, uh, just briefly. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Julia. That that was really thoughtful, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I think I, I I also tried to convey this. What I what I really appreciate about uh, the, the Anthropocene discourse and debate is is that that it allows us to bring together these these entities that we have treated so separately or also in different disciplines and that's exactly what adam was also just um referring to the a form of integration um of of science uh, scientific um and the sciences and the humanities um in a way that that we we have been we we missed that i think for many decades um and it in the environmental humanities that has already brought about so many new ideas and and uh, new fields and lines of work on the other hand as a historian of science i'm also of course always a science critic that's my job and as an sts scholar uh, i've been trained to be very cautious with science scientific truth claims and and that is something that i would like to bring in into the debate um since we have been cautious not to take at face value whatever scientific claim is being made about the physics of the earth, the biology of the human body, and so on. So, I mean, a lot of study fields, also in the environmental humanities, rely on being um, careful in our analysis of scientific truth claims. So we also need to be that and continue to do this when it comes to uh, Anthropocene and Earth system science, I think. So I understand also that there is a, a reluctance uh, to, to accept um, some of the the systemic understandings and perceptions that uh, Anthropocene science has brought out, uh, because I think they're perceived as totalizing and unifying as the as the the concept of the Anthropocene itself, and that is something that we also we need to take serious. I think. Thank you, Sabina. Uh, Sarke. Uh... I mean, <laughs> so much wisdom here and so much good points that what could you possibly say? But I, I would like maybe to perhaps empirically uh, question a little bit this uh, notion that you bring, Julia, that there as may, maybe you heard voices in this conference and other places where, where there seems to be a reluctance. My sense uh, is that, that there isn't so much of that anymore. After an initial phase, maybe five to 10 years ago, there were more skepticism among the humanities community uh, for some of the reasons that um, that uh, I think um, Sabina mentioned here. Then I'm, to add that list, I could add, for example, a fear of reductionism uh, with super big concepts and and then totalizing concepts. There is always this this. Uh, I think that is in in the DNA of humanities people is that you you you, you want to have as much nuance and differentiation as possible and so on. And that should be thought about. Uh, also, I think a fear of marginalization. I mean, you could, you, there, this glass could be half full and half empty. You know, the humanities can be sort of sucked into some science con project that that some people would would maybe seem it would seem risky to them. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, it could be the other way around. <laughs> it could be that we actually integrate these forces so as to gain more coherent and, and deeper understanding and then the humanities will infuse into the into the sciences uh, i'm more leaning towards the second actually or rather that the interaction is very vivid and, and, and there's a lot of potential in this but i can see some of those arguments although my basic point here is that i think re quite empirically there is less resistance to this uh, so to, let's call it Anthropocene thought 
than it now than it was some years ago. Then I think a very good point about rewriting in a sense the history of the 20th century from the viewpoint of the Great Acceleration. And I think that has already started. Um, in fact, there's been some work for, for a few years now uh, along these lines. There's been quite a bit of discussion among anthropologists about domestication, for example. I was in Oslo for a several months in a couple of winters ago where, where there was this uh, group working on, on particularly that, that theme. And um, uh, but, but I think what I would like to add there is that I think there is a continuation into the 21st century here. And I think some of the data that Depeche brought yesterday about the, the sort of the doubling time <laughs> of certain trends here that are even speeding up as we come into the 21st century, I think that's very useful. Um, useful information here. And if I were, if there is any point of what I said before about a receding, a slowing, that may be a re reducing kind of humanity, it's high time to do that. And then climate change, I think, I mean, you're right in, in, in the step to, to, to discuss really critically this um, separation and the, the sort of the hailing of the, or the, or the put it, uh, enhancing of the, the importance of the climate change. Uh, it should be we should look at it uh, as a context. On the other hand, I think that's a, a case where some of the pedagogy, I think, is already now practiced, <laughs> so to speak, and and more people are gaining uh, some some sense of what's going on through climate change. But it's important to widen the discussion. And I, I, I've, I've, uh, as many of you, I suppose, have read. Um, um, this Cambridge economist, Dasgupta, uh, part of Dasgupta's report to the, to the British government uh, earlier this year about uh, biodiversity loss and the no, I mean, it's a very, very sad uh, and, and important message that he brings. And I, I, I've been sort of oscillating here on some of the issues uh, over many years, but I'm getting even more concerned now than I was 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and um, and also very stimulated by how much we learn, actually, and how, what sort of discussions we can have now that we couldn't have before. Uh, so thanks for that, Julia. Thank you, Sverker, uh, also for that response. Uh, I think that uh, it's becoming uh, more and more clear, perhaps, that the, the Anthropocene as a, as a concept uh, to the humanities and social sciences is not, in fact, uh, an invitation to reductionism, but rather an expansionism of, of what the humanities and social sciences can do, which offers, of course, immense opportunities to solidify and expand and integrate uh, thought. Um, but it's time to move on to Rolando uh, for, for your kickoff. Rolando, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Adam. Well, let me say again that I'm really happy to be in this conversation. It's um, is very rich and very enriching as well. Well, I, I will try to be very brief, but I wanted to bring some points to the table that I that coincide with my previous interventions. Well, first, I think something that Adam uh, shows in his article on reconfiguring temporality as well is this connection between um, the drop in CO2 in the 1600s that is uh, proposed as one of the markers of the Anthropocene to genocide, to the loss of 50 million lives in the planet. And this mass genocide uh, cannot be explained but through the history of colonialism and the imperial project of the West. So, so I think here uh, the Anthropocene, as Saddam also explains in his piece, is unequivocally a history that is political and social, and that is also epistemic and aesthetic. It's not just a scientific history of the human on Earth, right? So it is a particular project of civilization that brings about um, this history. It is a history that is uh, connected to the destruction of Earth, the idea of the Anthropos separated from Earth and owner of the Earth. That is a very peculiar idea that you will not find, at least in any of the indigenous cultures that I know, or uh, philosophies, where actually uh, we are part of Earth in their thinking. And for them it's very absurd to understand um, that development and progress 
can come at the cost of Earth. That the more you consume the Earth, the more civilized you are. It's an absurdity for them. It has always been. And, uh, and now we are beginning to understand it from the epistemology of the West. Um, so this loss of Earth is what I have called in uh, my work uh, the condition of Earthlessness. And the condition of Earthlessness or the loss of Earth is connected to the loss of worlds, the loss of worlds of meaning, the loss of languages, of ontologies, of other ways of being human. This is what I have called worldlessness. So if we follow our premise that modernity starts in colonialism, Western modernity, because it's a moment in which Europe can posit itself as the center of the world, there is no Eurocentric project before colonialism, then this uh, project of civilization has brought about earthlessness and worthlessness together, the genocide and the destruction of earth together that you see very easily in the plantation model where uh, humans were reduced to enslavement for the production of commodities and where the uh, earth habitats were reduced to monocultures in a single system for the production of profit. So now, now second, because uh, we have just very few minutes, I want to say that these destroyed worlds or these worlds that have been uh, under erasure are the source of a different relation to Earth. And even today, the last resources on Earth are in what we might call indigenous or First Nations territories. As uh, very recently, Secretary General of UN, Antonio Guterres said, the l most of the last resources of the Earth are indigenous territories. And it's not because indigenous people could not exploit them to make money, but it's because they have a different relation to Earth. They carry other ontologies that I think we urgently need. And this is the role of the humanities in what we have been calling the decolonization of knowledge. How can we humble modernity? How can we go beyond this arrogance of the Anthropos and its uh, faith in a technology that is anthropocentric in kind, that instrumentalizes the earth even when it attempts to, to save it? So the non-anthropocentric worlds are relational worlds. They carry other ontologies that we might call relational that I will not have time to explain now but that are not based in instrumentality, in dichotomy, in linear rationality, but that are uh, based on the relation very deeply philosophically, they don't have uh, the one or the difference in its ontological principle, but their ontological principle is the relation. If they would place anything at the beginning, is not the one of a Kant or the difference of the post-structuralist philosophers, but this is the relation. For them, there is no life without relation. And that, that creates a completely different principle of thinking, a completely different principle of politics, of science, that, uh, that I think we need to pay attention to, and we need to learn from, and we need to listen to. So I think here with Arturo Escobar and many others, we are arguing for a transition to protect and to reproduce relational worlds and uh, and to humble the worlds that are uh, instrumentalized and mediated and uh, based on dichotomic hierarchies of patriarchy, gender, of uh, earth, uh, nature, civilization, of capitalism, etc. Now, this leads me to the last uh, open question that is also following from the invitation of Adam, and is how uh, we really need to take seriously two dimensions. One is the critique of technology that is often lacking in the discourses on the Anthropocene, where often the answer is connected to a technological response that is blind to the anthropocentric nature of that technological thinking. So can we think of other relational technologies and what would that mean instead of instrumental technologies? 
right? And second, uh, can we think of technologies of listening, for example? That is something that I advocate in my critique of design, for example. And the second element is the critique of time. And how can we go beyond this dichotomy that frames the humanities and the history of Western philosophy between immanence and transcendence, where there is a time that is transcendental and godlike or superhuman or utopian, or a time that is only radical immanence like new materialism is proposing. And how can we go towards a conception of time where we actually can understand the past as an active force to transform the present? And most of the indigenous struggles to preserve, and this is why I don't think for them is a question if the Anthropocene is happening or not, because in those places their clean water is gone, their fishes are gone, their uh, forests are gone, and it's very difficult for us to see it from the city because we have everything still in the supermarket, but in many places in the world their whole relation to earth is gone. And so the, for them it would not be a question if the Anthropocene is happening. And um, so for for most of these struggles, at least the ones here in Mexico and across Abyayala or the Americas, it is a it is a struggle for ancestrality. And ancestrality is not a mythical thing. It's not like a transcendental thing. Ancestrality is a relation to a lived history. It's what the people before us have lived and what memories we can gather to understand the present and what force that knowledge has to transform the present. So I think the notion of time that is bound between immanence and transcendence fails to understand a time that is deep, that is ancestral, and that in my work I have proposed for Western epistemology to understand it uh, and not to mythologize it, I have proposed the term precedence the idea that there is a time that precedes us and that is actually real and that has happened and that has a claim on us and that is radically diverse. It's not a past that can be turned into a monument like the fundamentalists will have it or the nation state will do, but it's a past that is infinite and radically open and that contains the possibilities of transforming the present if we do not forget. So the the struggles of First Nations, the Afro struggles, the women of color struggles that are all very deeply connected to also the, the struggle to preserve Earth and Earth beings are in this deep temporality that our philosophical frameworks fail to understand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rolando, for this uh, wonderful kickoff and rich with uh, thought provocation, thought provoking ideas and, and, uh, and perspectives. Um, we'll let everyone uh, respond to it. I thought about uh, connecting to, to what uh, Sverker mentioned earlier about the Desgupta review, which is this uh, economics of biodiversity, which is, I think, another example of trying to translate into the Western economic system the values of nature which have been uh, evident and obvious uh, to, to non-Western uh, civilizations for a long time or, or always. Uh, that's one of the aspects I really thought was, was striking and, and interesting in, in what you bring up. And also, of course, time, uh, which is a concept or, or a thing or whatever time is uh, that is dear and in, uh, to all of the speakers here today in different ways, I, I, I know. And I really important and it has been been up already also that we need to uh, find new ways of thinking of time and in particular as you say uh, of, of allowing the past to be active in the present and also perhaps the future so this linear time of of, um, of history of, of uh, western epistemology of the 20th century does not work very well with the anthropocene uh, but moving on, I think that Sabine will, will get the first chance to respond to this. Sabine, go ahead. 
Well, thank you so much, Rolando. Uh, that that was really fabulous. I, I think uh, you're you're putting your finger into the, the biggest wound of the Anthropocene, uh, as I perceive it right now. Uh, it is, uh, in a way, a, a Western capitalist um, modern notion of how the world has evolved and and perhaps also where it should it should go. It's it's just. It's, it might be integrative, but it's not inclusive and it's just invisibilizing so um, many other paths or, or histories or ontologies, as you, as you uh, uh, mentioned, um, and how to humble that concept of Anthropocene. I think that will be the biggest challenge. Otherwise, it won't have a good future. It will always sit awkward, awkwardly with us. Um, as uh, humanity scholars, I, th I think, um, and uh, and that's the, the the big effort to make. So, how to be inclusive without being integrative, and in that these systemic views um, covering up so many so many parts and histories that that are important to bring up, and then how can we still differentiate uh, without being evaluative or, or, or being segregational all the time so how can we uh, how can we do all these things together in parallel and and uh, that's i think what the environmental humanities are, are working on or working with and it's not an easy answer uh, I, I so i don't have an e easy a uh, quick answer to 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 uh, your questions um how to humble modernity uh, but i think we, we we need to find it Uh, sorry, Kerry. So, so uh, stimulated by what Ronaldo said. So, thanks for that. It, it seems to me that maybe um, that, that was an idea I got when you were talking was that maybe uh, for a future historian, um, the ideas you presented might be a, a very central element to, <laughs> to the history of the, to the future history of the Anthropocene, if if we can see that at par, as part of a sort of, so to speak, a remedy. I could say you, pro, you provided some of the elements for a remedy narrative. So that we have a lot of elements from, from Western side, the measurable things, the, the hockey stick curves. We already have the, much of the evidence for the, for the sickness <laughs> past, in a sense, the domestication past, and all of that. We can refine that. We can, we can find out much, much more about that. But I think it, we have often had, I think, a kind of a detached way of talking about indigenous knowledge as some kind of add-on, some abstraction that may, it's, so, it, it's, it's a small thing, we pay certain reverences to it, but it doesn't figure on the big scale. I think your potential of what you said was that it can figure on the big scale. If, if we can conceive of, of a, a, a sort of a future history of humanity where it acknowledges certain truths, that I, as I wanted to say at the very beginning, and, and then uh, try to adapt to that, then I, I think some, some of the elements of, of indigenous thought could be extremely useful. Uh, that is not to say that sort of Western science is not necessary, but, but it, the fusion of those could be probably driven much, much further. And again, I think much of this is political thought, not scientific thought. It, it's the politics of the indigenous knowledge that I think is really very important here. And I noticed also you use the word civilization pretty frequently, and I think I, what I try to hear, I try to hear what you what might mean with it. Uh, and maybe I think we share also in an approach to civilization, not as these all these kinds of sort of differentiating categories to divide up the world in different civilizations, but rather a syncretistic <laughs> notion of civilization as as a kind of a fate that, I mean, because I think that is really one of the core contributions of the Anthropocene thought is that it pro produces a humanity with a common fate. I mean, it, many humanists have taken that to mean that all the differences are gone, but I think you can see it from the more positive side that it actually produces a humanity with a common fate. And that requires also commonalities in thinking about remedies and ways forward, future history, so to speak. And I think you provided very, very good um, insights into that. Thanks. 
Thank you, uh, Sarke. Yeah, certainly uh, the concept of, of civilization is something that is up for uh, reconfiguring as well. And, and perhaps we will uh, end up with uh, an insight that, that what was called civilization was not actually civilization, but a pretext for exploitation. Mm. Uh, but there can be civilization still if the, the concept can be salvaged, uh, that's up for discussion. But another thing that comes to mind in, in hearing you, you you respond now, sorry, to, to Rolando's kickoff is, um, which I also thought about when you spoke, Rolando, is that um, the concept of relation, of course, and we speak of human Earth, a new human Earth relation, um, a new cosmology, uh, Bruno Latour, Dipesh Ekebartner and others are talking about a new relation, and, and then we need to figure out how a new human earth relation can be figured. And then there's a richness in indigenous thought and, and in Latin American thought, for instance, in Arturo Escobar, as you mentioned, uh, relational ontologies, and also a philosopher like uh, Edouard Lissant, uh, poetics of relation, uh, different ways of being in relation that really can be, I think, practiced and not just abstract. And as Varki said, not just uh, something that you can you know, be aware of, but actually something that can be useful. Uh, but now let's move on to Julia. It's your turn to, to, to have a chance to respond if you, if you want. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Orlando. I have three points I'd like to pick up on that have partly been picked up on already. Um, but I really liked your point about the loss of knowledge. And one of the ways in which I see the loss of knowledge, which particularly in its very rooted form, we're losing very quickly uh, is those agricultural practices back in Appalachia where I grew up used to be everybody had a little garden, knew how to grow a bit of food. And this was a supplement and a sense of autonomy that gave people great pleasure and also gave people a platform for civic society, exchanging information about this knowledge because knowledge is, of course, not something that's just kept to yourself. It's something that's always social. And as we are losing that local knowledge that you point to, that so many of us have pointed to, um, this will give us less resilience facing the, the changes to come. And this is one of the things that we have to say to our scientist friends particularly those scientists who have embraced the notion of a technosphere and want to keep the conversation at that level. Because technology, at least in my experience, is fragile. And its sociality is often very exclusive. But those local forms of knowledge that we are losing is more resilient and the sociality is better. So I think that that's a very important point. The second point that I really enjoyed that you uh, talked about was relational worlds. But I would like to um, say I have a little bit of trouble with just saying relational worlds. And the reason for this is that in my own field, there's a lot of talk about relational worlds. The Japanese, as they early modern people thought a lot about how politics should mimic nature. And, and there was a great sense, not of the divorce between humanity and nature, but of their cohesion. And that relation was always one of strict hierarchy. So I think there are a lot of relational worlds that can be imagined. But we have to, so we have to be careful to specify what sort of relational worlds we really want to now foster and think about and return to. And I think the ones you were referring to are particularly rich in their mutualism, which has an egalitarian quality. Everything you use is also reabsorbed and reused, whether this is ideas and knowledge or uh, food and feces, just to, just to be uh, overt. So how do we create uh, um, um, relational worlds that are cyclical and egalitarian, not just relational. And I think that that's important to see. The third point is, is actually to pick up on something that Adam said just a moment ago about the multiplicity of agency that the Anthropocene gives us. 
Because I think the thing that's so radical about the Anthropocene is that it allows us to see, well, it doesn't allow us to see, we have already seen through environmental history and earlier forms of history and, and human engagement with the world that we have been biological agents. We've always been that. We've always been chemical agents. We've always had, had fire, for instance. We've always been uh, physical agents. We have always also been geological agents. We have created harbors. We've moved rocks. We've been geological agents. And I think that when in 2009, Depeche used that phrase in his essay, The Four Theses, everybody thought, wow. I mean, and it was a wow moment. But it's actually inaccurate. We are now geostratigraphic agents. And perhaps a better way to put it is that we have become Earth system agents. And that adds a new form of agency. And Zverka, I think you were mentioning this, is the idea of being a, having a common fate, having now Earth system agency. But that doesn't supplant all these other forms of agency. It's an addition, and a very difficult to think about addition to our different agencies that we've always had. And that's what makes the Anthropocene so challenging, negotiating among these different agencies over space and over time. So thank you, Orlando. Very provocative, very rich, very interesting. Thank you, uh, Julia, for, for that uh, very interesting comment also. And uh, now uh, looking at, I think that this um, fantastic uh, set of kickoffs uh, testifies both to the, the richness and the possibility of the concept and the richness in intelligence of the speakers that we have already uh, used up most of our time. And we have also, in a kind of experimental fashion, actually covered most of what we promised in the abstract <laughs> without a script, which I think is a, a great success to, to, to my, my view, at least. Um, so uh, now is the time for questions uh, from the audience. So uh, if you have questions, uh, you can post them in the chat. You can post one to all of the speakers or to one individually, if you want to, uh, and they will uh, respond. And uh, while we wait for some questions to, to come in, uh, I just want to say that I uh, think that this has been an amazing uh, round table. And I think that it also have, has tied together all of as, as a keynote right, round table, also tied together to basically all of the previous keynotes in different ways. We have, have reached uh, subjects that have been up and been discussed from the first day to, to, to the last. And uh, the Anthropocene, it seems to me at least in, in su summarizing here that it, uh, I think that uh, Jürgen Renn on the first day said that he, was, uh, he has defended the concept of the Anthropocene and it seems that the concept is here to stay. And we have now seen in this discussion the, 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 the great possibilities of expansion that is actually inherent to it once we get accustomed and, and start to realize what we can do with it rather than and try to, to block it as such because it doesn't uh, it doesn't say that we should not add other uh, worlds other aspects but rather we can add them to this uh, but but again we're waiting for questions and I'm, I'm checking them but while we do um, the floor is uh, open, but now we have a uh, we have a Kate Rigby. So I will actually uh, read it. Uh, it's for you, Rolando, and uh, others also potentially. But starting with Rolando, then uh, she writes that I totally agree with your vision of the role of humanities. Uh, thanks so much. But I wonder how non-indigenous Euro, Euro Western scholars can help to lift up those alternative ontologies, epistemologies, and ethics without appropriation, misrepresentation, and speaking for. Do you think one avenue might be unearthing suppressed, forgotten alternatives within your Euro Western histories that might be brought into conversation with contemporary indigenous knowledges, understandings, and practices? This is a great question. I think, uh, Rolando, uh, you obviously can answer this first. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yes, it's a very complex question. Very good question. Thank you so much. It would take a longer response needed, but I will just give some uh, lines. Um, well, yes, first. 
uh, how can we not appropriate indigenous knowledge as it has been done by traditional anthropology and ethnography? I mean, not current anthropology or not all current anthropology, but the traditional method of appropriating the knowledge of others to produce, for example, Western medicine and um, or pharmace pharmaceutics, etc. There's a long history of appropriation, also food stuff and all of that. Uh, so one of the things that we have been concerned with is the question that I think is underlying this question is the question of decolonizing Europe. What does it mean to decolonize Europe? Europe that is a territory that was not conquered, right? Whose land was not appropriated. Uh, but so, but we think it's still a very relevant question. And we think that decolonizing Europe means, on the one hand, humbling modernity so de-universalizing it but also positioning it so we we don't advocate for de-universalization to go into relativism but we are advocate for the universalization to go into a position thinking position in, the, in relation to the colonial difference so how our life has been constituted through the suffering and the extraction of the life of others, human and non-human others. And the moment Europe begins understanding itself as that agent of history, uh, as an aggregate that has been built on the extraction of the life of Earth and the life of others, or the Western model of civilization, then it, it starts this process of humbling, of understanding its own history, not through its own self-narrative, not in a tautological way, as its canon has been, but through listening to the knowledge of others that know very well the history of Europe or the West, because they have been affected by it directly, but they know it from a completely different perspective, a perspective that we don't have in our canons. And so that is one thing. And in that process, one of the things that is coming about, uh, because this is a process happening, for example, in the Netherlands, the mus many museums are engaged with this process of decolonizing um, and the universities. Then what begins emerging is precisely those plural Europes that have been suppressed, or those plural ways that have been suppressed under the project of patriarchal modernity. So because there were no patriarchal worlds, there were worlds that were connected to the earth, like the forest gardens in Central Europe, and the indigenous of Europe as well. So, so the positioning and the humbling of the European canon is, let's say, unearthing a plurality of history that was not there very visible, and that was hidden in the darkness of the Middle Ages, and that today is a source of possibilities of encounter with indigenous knowledges. Uh, that is uh, today. Also, for example, our friend of video teaching Deliano with working with in Eastern Europe and how the potato becomes a food that comes to Europe to save Europe from the famines and that becomes a staple food. And well, the potato obviously is from the Andes and it is, as you said, Julia, it's not the product of nature just by magic. It's a product of the relation of civilizations with nature, like the corn in, in here in Mesoamerica. So these technologies that have also come to Europe uh, through appropriation, but that have also created very complex interactions. So I think, uh, yes, the question is very, very to the point of the tasks so that we have today of humbling the canons, of humbling Europe, not towards relativism, but towards positionality, because from positionality, we can engage in conversations. Only a humble Europe can begin listening to other systems of knowledge. Uh, a Europe that remains in the present of history in the arrogance of this contemporaneity. That's why we challenge the notion of contemporaneity. Do, does not have the capacity to listen to other knowledges. They only appropriate them. Listening implies a relation, implies being implicated. I will stop there because I will end up doing, giving another talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Rolando. Uh, it, it, again, I think it speaks to, to the, the, the richness and the interest of this subject and this panel and the, the, 
fantastic discussion we've had that we cannot stop, that we have to stop. I could go on all night discussing this, and I hope we'll get many, many more opportunities to return. Uh, thank you so much uh, to our four wonderful speakers for, for sharing so generously with your ideas and thoughts and perspectives and really enriching uh, this fantastic conversation. Uh, and uh, I would have let uh, all of our speakers uh, summarize, uh, but we don't have time for that because uh, Kathy Lindstrom is coming up in one minute to, to give us closing words of the whole uh, conference. Uh, so again, thank you uh, all the listeners. Thank you for the questions in the audience and, and uh, over to, to Kathy, I think now. Yes, thank you, Adam. And, and thank you to all the members of the round table. So it's, it's, it's not entirely clear if Anthropocene is going to end anytime soon, as Sverker suggests might, might happen, right? Um, and whether environmental humanities can lead us out of it, but it is very clear that this conference has come to an end and it's time for us to wrap up. So it is very hard to summarize all the discussions we have had during these days. It's been a true torrent of ideas, but nevertheless, I think there's one person who can lead us out of this. And I would like to invite Professor Svetka Serlin, the Vice uh, Head of the Division of History here at KTH, to, to say some concluding words. Yeah, well, uh, I barely have I <laughs> survived the round table uh, and now I speak again, but that has its logic as will become uh, apparent from what I will now tell you in a few minutes here at the beginning of this closing session. Um, dear colleagues and friends, dear fellow environmental humanists, spiritual or card carrying or otherwise there are many forms of environmental humanities i think uh, we are really yes and as Carter said approaching the end of what has been a rich dense and constantly stimulating conference as far as i'm concerned anyway uh, we wanted this first global open scholarship and artistic and activist environmental humanities conference because we think it is really the first of its kind to serve, we wanted it to serve as a wide open showcase of the growing and already very large and expanding field. Some would even say almost a wildly growing field. Uh, it's important to, to see what's going on basically, uh, to get an overview and to sort of rub each other. Uh, so that was our number one goal and we believe that we have achieved this despite circumstances. We also wanted uh, the field itself to broaden. We sort of embraced this idea. We had already seen it grow in particular parts of the world and in certain disciplinary and artistic contexts. We wanted to see the field come from new angles, intellectually, geographically, and socially. Uh, and again, I think we have seen some of that happen in this conference. Uh, my own sense is that due to the uncertainties, we with the pandemic and everything, we may actually have lost also some representation from some of the, not least the strongholds of environmental humanities. And we may also have probably lost some who would have come to streams uh, as their very first conference in the field if it had been physical, but now we're not in the position to take part. Still, at least to me, there were many new names both of institutions and of individuals, and certainly many new topics. Uh, the arts have been very much present. Early career scholars have brought a lot. They brought institutional and material aspects to the table. Issues of career making, merit value, the, really the hands-on of everyday life in the academic world. We have discussed competencies, the long-term purpose of building a field like this one. There are many fields, why should we have another one? Um, in particular, this is necessary, as I think many agree, that we are possibly leaving the very first exciting build-up phase and moving into a new phase, a phase with more regular activities, teaching programs, the possibilities of PhD training, international collaborations, the actual formation of centers in many places around the world and their possible continuation or reshaping. You can, of course, postpone those kinds of challenges associated with institutional stability for some time. 
but not forever. <laughs> they, they, at some point, they, they, they are there. And it seems to me that many are in this phase now. It is a fantastically good criteria, I think, of strength for the field that we are now contemplating such developments uh, of institutions and more stability. Discussions I heard demonstrated that there will be a lot of pluralism in this respect, and that's something I personally also uh, embrace. Probably disciplinary formation in certain places, uh, broader integrative contact zones in others, uh, and many more alternatives that will be explored. We need to continue sharing experiences as we go along so that we can learn from each other as we already do. I heard one comment in a session that I think is very valid to be observant on. Some of our closest friends in the humanities at large may think that as this cross-cutting field, along with a few others like digital humanities, medical humanities and so on, as these fields grow and are successful and uh, open up new avenues, that they do not progress in the same way in certain disciplines, in certain fields, that in fact they are retarding while the integrative humanities are thriving. And I think we should really seek ways to avoid this situation. The only reasonable approach, I think, is to refuse to see this as a zero-sum game. What should happen is for the entire humanities enterprise to be reinforced and grow, and for us to be part of that stimulation and activity on behalf of the common good, so to speak. That is where the environmental humanities, I think, can provide added support as well by bringing collaboration and perhaps also resources from our collaborations with the sciences, where we stand a bit stronger than many others. We should also look at the broad spectrum of humanities so as not to just stay in a small handful of disciplines uh, where there was a lot of energy from the beginning, like ecocriticism, history, anthropology, maybe a few others. This uh, continued institutional formation of the field will not be easy, I think, yeah. and it will re require diplomacy, finesse, creativity, and so on. But above all, it will build on the confidence that there is a need for something like this, that by bringing the wider humanities together, we can respond to the tendencies to marginalize humanities for lack of relevance to our huge contemporary challenges, because we see some of those efforts too, actually to marginalize us. That must not happen. And we are part of the answer, I think. We should also build hope both in our own community and in the communities we reach out to. We should be honest and say that the knowledge we represent, our society is needed. It is essential knowledge. We want to serve and we have important things to offer alongside with other knowledge fields. Transformative change, to use this catchword, needs competencies from those who know most about transformation and its many adversary forces. Those who have studied crises, human behavior, communication, media, religion, values, ideas, and not least conspiracies and the social effects of lying and lack of trust. How could you possibly bring emissions down and maintain social stability without the kind of knowledge and insight and empathy that the humanities represent. This conference had a very special beginning. Let me say a couple of words about that. Back in 2017, I'd like to think, <laughs> uh, some years ago anyway, some of us around 30, 35 scholars and an additional 15 or so PhD students gathered outside Munich to discuss the future of the field. Many good ideas came up and live on, I must say, in many ways. Um, the idea was also floated in that meeting that we should have an international meeting. There was some debate uh, clearly, but most, uh, most of us were quite enthusiastic. But there was also some caution, I think, who should take on the task and isn't it very laborious? Ultimately, uh, we volunteered from KDH to do it. 
so Marco and myself and uh, perhaps Sabine, I'm not sure exactly who were around, but enough of us were around to, to raise our hands and say, although not without considerable caution and a lot of respect for the challenges involved that we, we could do it. Um, and these challenges, they ultimately, as we know, turned out to be bigger than anyone could have predicted. Although we have at times been quite, uh, how shall I say, not discouraged perhaps, but feeling the, that there was a job to, to do, especially when it was clear uh, that it should be online, that that was the only solution. Um, we, we, we really f had a lot of struggle to, to do, but our confidence never failed. And now that we are here, we have made it happen thanks to many fantastic co-workers, both here at KTH, among students, and all the support from elsewhere, from around the world, really. We are happy that we actually did it and pursued it, that we, back in Munich at the time, volunteered. <laughs> We're also proud to have tried our best to contribute to an enterprise that is still open-ended, in constant evolution, in a vibrant community of scholars and artists and activists and practitioners in growing numbers of places in very different contexts. We don't know how this will end. We are in the midst of it and we still need to make that effort. Although our state of the world and the planet is far, far from where it should be, it is a, a situation and an environment, to put it that way, that we have now in the world, which makes the environmental humanities even more necessary. And many welcome us as well. So as a voice from the organizers, I would like once again to thank all of you who have contributed and been part. The success has above all relied on your work and your commitment. So thanks again and stay safe. <laughs>